My presentation is on the analysis of imaging data performed at the time of scanning, and I will describe how new developments in artificial intelligence have been integrated into the CMR workflow to take the CMR exam beyond imaging. The work that I will describe encompasses collaboration between a group that includes engineers and clinicians across a wide range of sites. There have been numerous technical developments in improving imaging and in quantitative mapping over the past several years. With the development of AI-powered machine learning, it is now possible to segment the myocardium and other structures and thereby directly report the measured values. These imaging biomarkers range from anatomical measurements, measurements of heart function such as ejection fraction, cardiac output, global longitudinal shortening, stress perfusion, and others such as tissue characterization and flow. We can now produce a rich set of imaging biomarkers. These are useful individually and have the potential to be analyzed jointly for detection and assessment of cardiovascular disease, which is shown in dotted lines, which is our aspirational goal. By performing the analysis in line, integrated into the scanning workflow, there are a number of potential benefits which can change the overall scanning paradigm. Firstly, by analyzing the scan immediately, the scan may be assessed for quality and can be repeated if needed. For instance, in the example shown on the right, the first pass arrival of the contrast bolus is late due to low cardiac output, evident from the input function displayed immediately following the scan. In this case, the stress needs to be repeated with a longer acquisition. Inline analysis has the potential for adapting the scan based on findings. In the example on the right, also using the output from inline perfusion analysis, it is possible to assess for potential valve disease and adjust the scan protocol to add the appropriate flow protocols. Conversely, normal findings may be used to shorten the study. Finally, inline analysis provides an initial indication of disease and severity that might be useful in prioritizing reporting. A patient with a severely reduced myocardial blood flow might be referred more quickly for follow-up invasive angiography. In the examples that I will show, sophisticated algorithms have been integrated into the clinical workflow using the Gadgetron Streaming Reconstruction Framework, which now includes inline AI developed by Hui Zhui of NIH. Now I'll present a few examples of the inline analysis to illustrate. This first example was developed recently by James Howard, Graham Cole, and others at Imperial College London and Hammersmith Hospital, and integrated on the scanner using the Gadgetron inline AI by Hui Zhui. A transaxial stack of ECG-triggered single-shot white blood diastolic images may be rapidly acquired at the start of the study to assess for abnormalities. The stack is interpolated and segmented on the fly using a convolutional neural network to define various structures such as ventricles, atria, myocardium, the aorta, and pleural effusion. An inline analysis report of these measurements is generated within several seconds of the completion of scan. Abnormal values may lead to additional measurements that might otherwise not be planned in the protocol. For example, patients found to have LVH and pleural fusion on axial anatomy images may have a diagnosis of cardiac amyloid in which pre-contrast T1 maps would be useful. Manual contouring of cine images for measurement of volumes and function can be very time consuming and a number of groups have reported on the use of machine learning for automating this task. The work by Rodri Davies at the Bart, Bart's Heart Center and UCL has achieved a precision that exceeds experts by using the valve plane at both end systole and end diastole in conjunction with the short axis CINE stack to compute the volume and thereby remove a large source of invariability. The valve plane is used together with the machine learned contours at end diastole and end systole and a report is generated automatically following the completion of the acquisition, streamlining the analysis and providing immediate assessment. In addition to the analysis of LV volumes and function, Hui Zhui has recently developed an automated AI-based inline analysis using anatomical landmarks to automatically measure global longitudinal shortening, MAPSI, and other imaging biomarkers. Here you see a four-chamber retrograded CINE on the top left. Landmarks are found using AI 
To define the mitral annulus and apex for each cardiac phase is seen on the top right. And these are used to plot the LV length versus cardiac phase, which is in turn used to compute the global longitudinal shortening as plotted here in the lower left, and the mitral annular velocity as shown on the lower right. The a report is automatically generated within seconds following the completion of scan. The report currently includes the MAPSI, the global longitudinal shortening, as well as systolic and mitral annulus diameter, apical rocking, which is a marker associated with asynchrony, frequently found in left bundle branch block, and mitral annular velocity. A powerful method for evaluating the precision of machine learning techniques has been developed by the group at Bartar Center. Their approach uses a data set consisting of CINE images of the same subject acquired in two separate studies for 160 subjects, including patients and controls. This is described in a paper by Anish Bhuva et al. in CERC Imaging. We use this to evaluate the precision of our AA landmark-based measurement of global longitudinal shortening and MAPSI. The Bland-Altman plots for global longitudinal shortening and MAPSI using the fully automatic AI method are on the left, which outperforms a human expert shown on the right. We studied the prognostic significance of both AI-derived MAPSI and GLS on a cohort of 1,572 patients with 5.6 years median follow-up. This analysis was done in collaboration with Eric Shelbert at UPMC. The Kaplan-Meier survival curves for AI-measured GL shortening are shown here for survival free of hospitalization and death. Other outcomes have been studied as well. Both MAPSI and GL shortening Kaplan-Meier curves were generated in five bins separated by standard deviation increments to illustrate the dose-response relationships. The chi-squared values for the MAPSI on the left from Cox regression models show greater associations with outcomes than GLS on the right and both associated better than EF. The AI measurements done in only seconds slightly outperform the manual measurements, which require 10 minutes. We've recently added inline analysis for tissue characterization. We are using a multi-parametric SASHA approach, which simultaneously provides both T1 and T2 maps in a single free breathing acquisition. This was developed by Kelvin Chow of Siemens Healthcare in collaboration with NIH. We've added the capability to automatically generate both bright and dark blood synthetic PSIR late gadolinium enhancement images in cases of post-contrast mapping. While quantitative T1 and T2 maps are excellent for assessment of diffuse disease, focal scar such as subendocardial MI as shown here is better visualized with late enhancement, which has positive contrast and nulls the normal myocardium. This new all-in-one sequence is proposed, can provide both mapping and late enhancement. In this example of a patient with a chronic subendocardial MI, the top row shows the post-contrast T1 and T2 maps, and the bottom row shows the synthetic bright and dark blood LGE calculated from these maps. In this patient, the contrast between the subendocardial MI and adjacent blood pool is poor being difficult to assess confidently with either the T1 map or the bright blood LGE. However, the dark blood LGE provides significantly improved contrast, permitting confident detection. Multi-parametric maps are well suited for AI-based segmentation due to having multiple contrasts with signal differences between the myocardium and blood. An AI segmentation algorithm was co-developed by James Howard of Imperial College and Hui Shui of NIH and integrated to run inline on the scanner to produce 16 sector AHA bullseyes for T1 and T2, as well as ECV using a synthetic hematocrit done within seconds following the scan. Segmentation and reporting of T1 and T2 values permits rapid determination of abnormality. And this is an example of a patient with acute infarction with LGE and elevated T2 and ECV. Rapid assessment of native T1 and T2 values in the myocardium can be useful for determination whether post-contrast mapping and ECV are warranted, such as in cases of amyloidosis. Finally, I'd like to speak about inline quantitative myocardial perfusion mapping and, and a few new developments. Quantitative mapping provides a rapid objective assessment of ischemic heart disease, and we are exploring the potential for automated classification. 
Inline analysis has been used to flag severe cases for immediate reporting, and in a few cases has led to prioritizing patients believed to be at risk. Inline quality assessment is possible, which is routinely used by some sites to determine whether the stress is acceptable quality or needs to be repeated. The approach that we've taken for perfusion mapping is based on converting the signal intensity time curves for both the myocardium and blood into units of contrast agent concentration, which we input to the kinetics model that is used to estimate perfusion. We are using the dual sequence approach to measure the myocardium and blood with separately optimized sequences, which is easy to use in a clinical workflow. We spent considerable time on the accurate conversion of signal intensities to units of GAD concentration and also output the arterial input function for overall quality assessment. The processing of the dual sequence blood images to generate the AIF GAD signals highlighted in gray in the lower processing path shown here. The AIF is also known as an indicator dilution curve and indicator dilution analysis in various forms to include invasive techniques with optical dyes or other tracers has been used for over 100 years. These indicator dilution curves contain a great deal of potentially useful physiological information. And we are now beginning to extract and report this automatically from first pass CMR perfusion. Firstly, for a known amount of contrast administered, it is possible to estimate the cardiac output directly. The pulmonary transit time and the pulmonary blood volume may be estimated from the passage between the right and left ventricles. And finally, the shape of the indicator dilution concentration curve contains information on the valve function and pulmonary hypertension. The basic method for calculating the cardiac output from an indicator dilution curve is described here. The cardiac output in liters per minute is equal to the total dose in millimole units divided by the integral of the first pass of concentration. Since the volume of GAD injected is known and the indicator dilution curve is accurately measured, the cardiac output can be estimated in this way. In this example, the dose was five milliliters of doterm, corresponding to two and a half millimole, and the cardiac output is calculated to be 5.6 liters per minute. The two, true concentration is fit empirically to exclude the recirculation, which is very important in computing the mean transit times. The accuracy of this method relies on the image quality as well as on the accurate conversion to GAD units, which we have validated on both healthy controls and patients and using both doterm and gadavist. The quality is sufficient to measure the cardiac output in roughly 85 to 90 percent of the cases. And in patients with valve disease where both the CINI and flow estimates are less accurate, the indicator dilution analysis should provide a reliable estimate. Approximately one minute following the completion of the rest perfusion scan, an automatic report is generated summarizing the indicator dilution analysis, which includes the PTT, pulmonary blood volume, and cardiac output, and also includes quality metrics for the goodness of fit for the concentration curves. We've extended the original method for automatically segmenting and extracting the LV signal, which is used as the AIF for perfusion quantification, and now segment and extract both the RV and LV in order to measure the mean transit time by the centroid method. Use of the centroid in estimating volumes is described in the original literature on indicator dilution analysis, and the specific setting of CMR has been recently validated by Martin Ugander and others reported in radiology. The pulmonary transit time increases with pulmonary arterial pressure and with pulmonary blood volume. Both PTT and pulmonary blood volume have been shown to have prognostic significance in heart failure patients as reported by Richie et al. in their PROVE HF study published in the European Heart Journal's Cardiovascular Imaging. The pulmonary blood volume can be estimated from the mean transit time between the RV and LV indicator dilution concentration curves and the cardiac output during rest perfusion. Mean transit times are calculated from the concentration curve fit to the first pass excluding the recirculation and shown as dotted lines in these figures. In this way, accurate PTTs may be estimated even in the presence of valve disease which has an advantage over the commonly used method based on peak to peak. The dispersion of the LV curve is proportional to the pulmonary transit time, as clearly shown, and further broadened in subjects with low cardiac output. 
The prognostic significance for this automated method for estimating PTT from rest perfusion has been recently described by Andreas Serafim of the Bart's Heart Center in a study of 985 patients with median follow-up of over two years, presented earlier at this conference. The shape of the concentration signals contains important physiologic information, giving an indication of valve disease, shunts, or pulmonary hypertension. On the left, the indicator dilution curves are shown for a normal subject, and the curves show low dispersion and are fairly symmetric. In the center, the patient has moderate tricuspid regurgitation, which leads to a marked skew in the RV curve. And on the right is an example of a patient with moderate mitral regurgitation with a skew in the LV curve. These curves are displayed immediately following the rest perfusion. Although the shapes are not specific, abnormality may be detected, and this can be used to drive acquisition of additional scans, such as aortic or pulmonary artery flow, which might otherwise not be in the routine clinical protocol. In summary, the ability to use artificial intelligence methods for automated segmentation and landmarking provides opportunity for automated measurement and reporting of new biomarkers which may lead to quantitative metrics and objective assessments. One of the challenges is the establishment and clinical validation of normal ranges and cutoffs. Finally, there are several benefits for implementing the analysis in line at the time of scanning, ranging from the quality assurance so that scans may be repeated if necessary, to adapting the imaging protocol according to new findings, and to having initial indications that might prioritize reporting. I would like to conclude my presentation with acknowledgments. Foremost, I want to acknowledge the major contribution that Hui Zhui has had in all aspects of the work that I presented. And I want to thank our global network of collaborators, both scientific and clinical. It was a tremendous honor to receive the gold medal from the Society last year. I want to thank the Society and all the members. It was particularly special for me to receive this honor last year together with Jeanette, who's a friend and colleague for many years. I attended the meeting in 2004 in Barcelona for my first time. The meeting was less than half the size of today, perhaps much smaller. I'm pleased that the scientific portion of the annual meeting has grown so significantly. I want to thank all the people I've worked with and learned from. There are too many people to acknowledge individually, but there are a few I'd like to recognize and thank. Firstly, to Bob Balaban and Elliot McVeigh, who gave me an opportunity to join NIH over 20 years ago to start a new career when I was unknown in the field. I want to thank the entire group at NIH, the clinical team, the scientists, students, fellows, and a very special recognition to Hui Zhui, who's a superstar. I want to thank both Eric Shelbert of UPMC and Martin Ugander, now at the University of Sydney, both former fellows of NIH, who were among, among my first external collaboration research partners. And I want to especially thank both James Moon and Mariana Fontana and all the members of their teams for welcoming me into their research groups in London. And to thank the technical team at Siemens, our industrial partner, who I work closely with in translating new ideas into becoming reality to make a lasting difference. Being part of the society and working in CMR has been very rewarding. Thank you all very much. <laughs>